YOLO composing gloves here and today we're going to be going over the next lesson. I'm going to do this one in sections uh, because we got to chunk some of these things down into sizable pieces. So we say okay lesson three the sub oscillator. We sort of got we got up to this point and now we're going to dive in right. So this is a branch of sort of our study of the sine wave and in order to understand this, the, we got to the point where we understood that the sine wave, right? If we could, we could put a sine wave into any signal, and if we just had the correct phase and the correct amplitude relationship and the right frequency, we could alter a signal. Let me get rid of this uh, extra wave candy here. Actually, we'll leave it there. What the heck? It's fancy. So we say, okay, we could do this. Now let's talk about like some applications of this. So one of the applications is this thing called a sub oscillator. And so we're going to look at this sort of from the mode of thought of layers and heavily mode two uh, for now. So layers and also just the mode of thought of um, mode of a changing element within a sound. So we say, okay, what, a sub is, what, a, what is a sub oscillator, right? Well, a sub oscillator is an oscillator that outputs frequency in the range of, you know, 100 hertz to... 100 hertz down to 30 hertz, all the way down actually. And 100 is kind of is kind of high, but it fills in this lower part of the frequency spectrum. So let me really quick just go ahead and give you an example of what a sub oscillator sort of sounds like. So here I've got a frequency of this, I'm using uh, citrus just because you know I'm outputting a sine wave at 100 hertz. So it's really there's you know a little more exact than synth one. So here. I've got a frequency of 100 hertz, and I'm going to sweep it down for you. Now, that's 30 hertz. I can hear it fine over, a head, over some nice headphones. And if we, if we keep going, generally you don't want to go uh, much lower, but at that point, you can't, you should not be, if you can somehow hear that, this should be more of a feeling than something you can hear. If we go up, pretty interesting how low this is. So this is responsible for sort of the rumble and thump and the feeling of sound. Um, some people have even used it as a gimmick. They put things on you that vibrate and a lot of times it's linked up to how the sub hits. So uh, this, is, this is a pretty important range of sound. It's responsible for what we would call warmth. It's also responsible for mud, um, meaning uh, um, but it just sounds unclear what's going on down there. So we want to be, we want a clean sub range. However, sometimes you don't. Maybe you're writing a song where it's supposed to be sort of muddy down there. It just depends. Maybe you're writing noise music. Uh, so that's the sub bass range. That's the waveform. And generally we use it to add a little bit of extra of that warmth to a sound or to increase the role of the fundamental frequency. So let's go ahead, let's grab an instance of synth one now. So here is synth one, and we come out with our basic preset. Let's go ahead, let's turn that to a saw wave. Turn the volume down, maybe. So if we bring up our sub oscillator, let's make it a sine wave. Uh, we could hear that, let me just play a little higher. And if we take it away, So we get that sort of an effect. Our low end definitely comes up and reduces our high end. And actually the low end eats a lot of headroom due to problems with the Fletcher Munson curves because our perception of bass needs to be boosted quite substantially while listening at lower volume levels. So when you listen louder, you will actually mix the sub differently. So, I mean, that's sort of, this is sort of just a tangent, but you really want to be cautious of the level you're listening to this stuff at because it will change how you mix it. And it mostly affects how you treat the high and low end. Uh, in particular, the really low, low end. Because um, suddenly when you master it, you, and if you haven't mixed at a proper level, you'll want your your mid-range will suddenly just start suffering. And when you're doing your final mixes, you might be going, what's going on? Well, the answer is your sub is way too freaking loud. And so you're bringing up the sub more. And it's eating all your headroom. You don't have any more room. So we have our sub. And we get this sort of a sound from it. So we get this warmth from it. And we want to, you know, find a nice level. Now, if we add in different oscillators, which we're not going to consider right now, but essentially we're treating it as an oscillator when we do that. And I have another video where really, where we're really going to talk about what's going down here. Like we're going to talk about the harmonic series is going to get intense, man. So 
Uh, so anyways, we get we notice this is the general reason for it, and it's a common thing in sense. We notice why not just have an why not just call it another oscillator, you know? Why not? But we notice that this is a thing. Look at this. In Harmer, they've got a sub area. Since one is a sub area, I know that's only two examples, but there are plenty more examples where, especially in additive synthesizers, because of the way they generate sound, they will have areas designated for sub rules. It's meant to generate frequencies around that range. And so we might go, go we might be asking why. What a sub oscillator does, and you you may wonder why I have an oscillator specifically for this. Why not just have another full fledged oscillator, which is kind of what we have. And we notice we can make it occur at no octaves below, so we could have it affect the fundamental frequency. So this now basically is just a boost to the fundamental, or you could go an octave lower. There's a chord with an octave lower. There's an up. And we should notice this is a per note thing. So this is going to generate a frequency for every note that we hit. So if I hit a chord like this, I'm getting three boosts at every one of those notes because I'm playing three notes. If we're here, I am again. And when we talk about the harmonic spectrum in that next video, you're going to start to see the implications of what I just said, like how crazy this can get. I mean, I should do a whole separate one just on the music theory that's going down. I plan to do um, one for that, but from a different sort of viewpoint. So... Okay, uh, let's go down here. In order to truly understand the purpose of the sub oscillator section, um, and we could take any oscillator really, and as long as it can generate frequencies in that range, we can make it a sub oscillator as a rule. So a lot of things like massive, they don't have a section specifically for it. They just, you know, just use it for that job. And now, boom, now it's a sub oscillator. So not every sub will like have a set, like, oh, this is supposed to be the sub. We could use any oscillator, it can play notes or uh, frequencies in that range and make it a sub oscillator. So what's the purpose of this section? Why would we want to think about things as a sub oscillator? And to do this, we are going to delve into what gives sound pitch. And I'm, I'm going to link, I'm going to have quite a few links in here because there's a number of interesting conundrums that sort of come up. So we say, all right, you've probably heard a trumpet, you've probably heard a flute. In fact, I even have a trumpet and a flute um, right here. So here's a trumpet. I'm having buffer issues because it's still loading samples. But here's a flute. And I'm willing to bet that if you closed your eyes and I said, okay, close your eyes, and I'm going to play one of these instruments, and you got to tell me which one it is. And now, which one is this one? Okay, I'm going to play a different one. Here we go. You probably are able to guess with almost 100% accuracy, unless you have some weird problems, that... Which one's the flute and which one's the trumpet? I could even, like, close your eyes. Which one is it now? And now you might be going, hey, that doesn't sound like either of those. It sounds like a clarinet. Like, if you're familiar with these sounds, they you should have absolutely no problem figuring out which ones they are. When you get an orchestration, though, you'll be showing some pretty, some examples where it's like, suddenly when you start mixing them, it's a different battle. But separately, they are very easy to tell. And the reason is, uh, we have here, here's the spectrum of a trumpet. So this is the trumpet spectrum. Here's the spectrum of a flute. And so I have the timbre of the trumpet. This is a G6. So we notice here, this is a, a uh, Fourier transform. So it's breaking down our trumpet signal into a summation of sine and cosine waves, and then graphing them on this here graph where we have amplitude one way and frequency the other. So frequency on the x-axis, amplitude on the y-axis. And we look at this and we say, gee, look at this. These first two harmonics are really loud and they, we see it gets softer. And over here, we notice on the flute, the we have a very strong fundamental, the first harmonic, and then we get softer, completely different patterns. But we notice that, look at this, the spike on the fundamental is in the same spot. That's how you know it's playing the same note. If you have any instruments playing the same note, they will be in the same spot. If we come down here, oh yeah, here's a, if you want this analyzer, by the way, uh, here's a video where I show you where you can get it for free. Um, but I, oh, this is a little paragraph explaining the DFT and uh, how it generates these, these frequencies, but we care about the lowest and loudest one. That's the fundamental, right? That's the one we care about. That's the one that gives each of these sounds. It makes it sound like they're playing the same note, the same pitch, while the rest of the frequencies are used to 
perceive a timbre. That's actually spelled timbre, like T-I-M-B-R-E. Um, but it's pronounced timbre because I believe it's a French word and that French just have different ways of saying things. So when we have these different timbres here, uh, it's the overtones that give the sound that sound while it's the fundamental. Now, this is not where pitch, this does not always hold true. We can have a fundamental missing and we can actually infer what the fundamental is based on the overtones. We're going to talk about that in a separate video. So what our big thing, though, is they share the fundamental. This is really important. So this means if we take, if we start messing with this, we can get some unusual perception problems. So we have, uh, I'm going to include an audio example of a flute and a clarinet and a trumpet and all those things. But if, if we were to like, say, toss in a whole bunch of voices, like I've got, um, I've got here a pattern that has them all. Check it out. So there's a trumpet playing a note. Same fundamental, different harmonics. So you got a pretty good listen there. We hear that they're all playing the same note and octave equivalents are the same for us here. Well, actually in the video about layers, we're going to see how octaves can really be kind of a weird deal, but the fundamentals will hold true across multiple spectrums. Our ears and brains are insane at being able to tell about this stuff because uh, you know flutes in a different range than the, than the trumpet and the trumpets in a different range than the tuba and the voice is sort of in the middle so they're all playing the same i believe it's a g i don't have perfect pitch yeah it's a g i wrote the note i should know so they're all playing a g and we could tell that although we hear all these different sounds it's really uh, it's really a pretty incredible deal so there'll be like a video of just that without me doing all this talking there too and so that's a, that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, all the frequencies. Okay, so these sounds aren't static sounds. Their spectrums are changing. The trumpet has frequencies in the upper end going back and forth. It's not staying the same. That's the sound's flux. If we could remove the flux, we'd re we would receive a static spectrum, and it would actually sound nothing like a trumpet. It sounds more like a robot. Like, check it out. We can actually do that. So if we were to take this here trumpet... We see our spectrums changing up here. But if we were to really quick, uh, if we were to really quick record this, we toss in. I used to have the, all this memorized a lot better. Um, on input. All right, that's good enough for me. Whoops, come on. All right, so we have a recording of a trumpet in here now. I could take a sliver of this spectrum and I can open up a new Harmer. And Harmer's really cool because it can take this spectrum and replicate it with pretty astounding accuracy. Whoops, I didn't want that there. I wanted it there. So there's this little piece of the trumpet. And we can come in here and change the speed to basically nil. And did I change the envelope? Yeah, to get rid of that. All right, so here we have... So that's what we would get if it was remaining static at that particular moment in time. It would be actually at the beginning of this. So, uh, so that's what I'm trying to say. There's a, there's a large amount of flux happening here. And this is a, just pointing it out to you in a way that's just like, there it is. I don't know if you've ever heard the track. Um, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's like Timmy, play your trumpet. Oh, man, how's it go? It's like... Uh, I don't, I'm not going to sing it. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's got this gnarly, like it's a pretty good track. They've got, except for when they say play trumpet, it's like a baritone or something. I'm like, what? This is not a trumpet. Um, but anyways, apart from that, pretty interesting stuff we have going on here. So uh, our perception of pitch comes from this, but we also have this astounding ability to sort of account for flux and changes in spectrum along with different ranges and different spectrums. So our, it's, pretty, it's pretty intense stuff going on here. Um, now, uh, our octave equivalent is a bass two. So every time a frequency doubles, we hear an, a doubling, we hear it as an octave increase, as if it was the same note. So for example, if I were to come in here to a citrus and play a note, 
right now it's outputting a note. I could say play twice that note. So that would be times four, right? Because you're at times two, two times two is four. And we would hear the note an octave up. We could even go one more. So that would be eight. And they all sound like the same notes. And that's because we hear frequency and a log base two, which means things have to double. And so I'm going to refer a ton to the logarithmic nature of sound and how sound is not linear and how it causes problems up the spectrum. It's really pretty important for a lot of important takeaways. So I actually have a video on logs for audio, for audio people, right? And in this video, you just have to know how to multiply and divide. And it actually, if you really get the video, you'll know logs better than a lot of um, math people, math students, because they memorize these sort of abstract properties, but they don't really know what they're messing with. Like they don't get that these are multiples that we're, we're working with here. And so uh, just, just understanding this, when you look at logs, suddenly log, when you're, when you're doing, taking logs of things, it's a lot easier to see why the things are the way they are. In our case, we work in log base two because that's how we perceive sound. We perceive it as a ratio. Vsauce even has a video on this. Um, he talks about how we perceive things in ratios. Heck, maybe if I remember, I'll include it here. Or someone will comment about it and they'll remind me. And I'll be like, oh yeah, I need to put that in there. So, okay. And again, I know this skipping uh, a video about math for audio. I don't want to I don't want to watch this, but really it's more about a conceptual understanding. It starts, it has a basis in math, sure, but it's really important. I really want to emphasize that you should watch this and get, get an understanding or at least know that this is a thing happening. And I know it's a longer video, but you got to build up. If I just suddenly jump to conclusions, there, there'd be no, you'd be like, how the heck did you get there? So I try to be as fluid as possible. Okay. So knowing this, now we know why the sub the, why the base oscillator exists. So we just talked about all this stuff. And now when I say things like the base oscillator's primary function generally is to reinforce the fundamental, you know what that means. You have some understandings of what that may even sound like, and you have some understandings of what this can do for you. And we're going to do exercises that will ingrain this further in you. But now it should be exceedingly clear that this is what it's for. And this is where I want to stop this video because... Uh, we're going to talk about some unusual cases coming up next. This has gone on. This also has gone on long enough. So there you have it. You now know like why notes sound the same with well, the fundamentals and how incredible your brain is at peeling these things apart. We know that we can mess with the spectrum using a sine wave. And in the next coming videos, we're going to do exactly that. And it will be, it will become way more clear uh, further. It'll become further really clear. So what I want to encourage you to do at the end of this video, after you, even after you finish this, open up a synthesizer, be it synth one or whatever, because synth one has a sub. That's why we're talking about it. That's why it's even came up. It's because of the sub oscillator section and begin screwing with it, man. Turn it on, turn on some different spectrums here and create some sounds. Try and write melodies that make sense in what you're dealing with. It's really a pretty cool phenomenon. If you have any questions about this stuff, let me know. If you have any additional insights, let me know. I generally post, if I have stuff done early, I post them to my Patreon page because you're a patron and I appreciate your support. So you get a little, you know, you get to go at things a little bit earlier. Subscribe and have a blessed day.